All right, well, it's it's noon now, so why don't we go ahead and get started? Um, thank you for everyone for joining us today. Um, we're excited to kick off the Finance Lab 101 series this semester um, with this first session, Demystifying the Cutler Center with Patrick Gregory. I'm sure that most of you know Patrick Gregory. He's the Managing Director of the Cutler Center, a Senior Lecturer in the Finance Division, and he's also the Faculty Director of the Babson College Fund. Um, in today's session, Patrick's going to provide an overview of the Cutler Center, discuss the tools and resources available to students, and also share some insights into how tools like Bloomberg and FactSet are used to manage the Babson College Fund portfolio. Um, in general, I just want to um, provide an overview of what the series is intended to do. So um, the hope is that we'll provide students with introductory sessions on the various analytical tools available in the Cutler Center Finance Lab. So we hope that all of you will continue to join us throughout the series. Future sessions will be led by our Cutler Center assistants and students will have hopefully have the opportunity to attend either in person or online. So more to come on those sessions um, as those uh, dates approach. Um, I encourage everyone to ask any questions throughout today's session. Um, we'll also be recording it and it'll be available on our Cutler Center website afterwards. So um, with that, I will turn it over to Patrick and we'll get started. Thanks, Leslie. I'm just going to share a slide deck Is everyone able to see that? Yep. yep. Great. So uh, first, I uh, just wanted to say hello. As Leslie mentioned, I am the uh, managing director of the Cutler Center and a professor in the finance division. Um, now, what I'd like to do today is just spend a few minutes highlighting uh, the Cutler Center offerings and then discussing the resources specifically that are available in the lab, which really can be used to develop valuable skills that will help you to secure an internship and your first job, or really to set your uh, career on a trajectory that it wouldn't have otherwise. And so, um, as Leslie had said, you know, happy to to take questions along the way, and then I've built in some time for Q and A at the end as well. So, the Color Center's mission is really to enhance Babson's innovative and practical approach to finance education through both programs and resources that enrich the student learning experience and improve the marketability of our alumni. And when you think about the offerings through the Cutler Center, they're really divided into three broad categories. Those are our investments lab uh, that's located in the new Babson Commons, experiential learning programs like the Babson College Fund that I'll talk about in just a minute, and various thought leadership events that position Babson at the forefront of finance education. Today, we're gonna to focus uh, most heavily on the, the finance lab, which is equipped with 42 workstations that have a wide array of analytical tools that are used by investment professionals. Now, the, the new lab, uh, as I say, not only in, in incorporates a wide array of uh, data and analytical tools that are used by professionals. But importantly, these resources are also integrated into the graduate and undergraduate curricula so that you can hit the ground running when uh, looking for internships and full-time employment. In fact, one of our goals is to ensure that as you uh, enter into an internship, it's not gonna be just you typically, it's gonna be you and uh, a group of students typically from other colleges and universities. And ideally, we'd like to have uh, you be head and shoulders above those students coming out of other schools. And um, one of the ways that we do that, in fact, you can see it from the, the photo that I have here. This was taken at our annual trading competition last year that was hosted by Fidelity Investments. And through the trading competition and Professor Davies' uh, financial trading strategies course, we try to identify students who will represent Babson each year in the Rotman International Trading Competition up in Toronto. In fact, we have a group of students that are participating in that competition today. And um, you know, not only does it, does it provide an experience for, for those students who have an interest in trading as a, a career path, but it also opens them up to uh, a group of alumni 
that are currently in that space who really act as mentors for the students uh, throughout the competition. Now, when you think broadly about the finance lab, uh, there are a number of resources. And among those, um, I've, I've listed some here for you. FactSet, Bloomberg, Thomson Reuters, Cap IQ, Morningstar, Argus. Um, so a wide array. And as I mentioned, what we're gonna do today is we're really gonna focus in on FactSet. But um, what we hope to do is to highlight many of these other applications through uh, subsequent sessions that we'll offer this semester. So with that said, um, rather than just bringing up facts and, and showing you the uh, showing you the platform, I thought that I'd demonstrate how it's used to improve investment decisions. Uh, specifically, what I'm going to do is illustrate how it's used by students who are in the Babson College Fund. And these students manage a portion of the college's endowment, specifically, as you can see here, they manage about $4.3 million of the college's endowment, so not an insignificant amount of money. And also importantly, what you see here is that they have a long history of outperforming the market. In fact, their performance in 2020 would have ranked them among the 99th percentile of large cap managers based upon Morningstar data. Um, and one of the reasons for the strong performance is that they integrate facts that into their investment process. In fact, I would say that it's an integral uh, part of the idea generation, the fundamental analysis, and the portfolio management that they do. So, with that in mind, let me just try to give you a sense of how the fund is structured before we jump into to facts. And it will just provide a little bit of context for you as, as we move throughout the platform. So, um, as you can see, this is the characteristics of the portfolio. And I'm going to show you where we're going to get that out of facts in just a minute. But basically, what you see here is that we run a concentrated portfolio of 50 to 60 securities. And the fund is structured as an all equity portfolio. But one thing that's important is that we can actually take both long and short positions. And when you think about that, what that does is it gives us the ability to, to really better uh, utilize the research that underlies um, our investment process. Certainly much more so that could be done at uh, student managed funds at other colleges and universities that limit their students to only taking long positions in the portfolio. So let me give you a simple example. Uh, one of the companies that we uh, that we owned last year was called California Resources Corp. Uh, and that was pitched to short. And when we moved to implement the trade, uh, it was determined that a put option would, it was actually a much better means of expressing our negative opinion on the stock. And so during the pandemic, uh, the company got hit particularly hard and the stock plummeted down to $2 per share. And what ended up happening was we were able to, uh, to cover that position and lock in a gain of about 573% on that put contract, which when you think about it relative to a traditional short, the most that we could have made there was 100%. And so much bigger or what we call leverage returns by selectively uh, using some derivative contracts to express either uh, strong positive or negative opinions on a particular stock. So um, when you think about the portfolio, I've got a number of characteristics that are, that are listed here. Um, you know, overall, I would categorize the fund as a high quality growth fund. Um, and a couple of things that you can see here. One is that the market cap for the Babson College Fund tends to be lower than that of the S&P 500, which we're benchmarked against. And part of the reason for that is that we typically find it's easier to identify mispriced securities by moving down the cap spectrum. The other thing that, that I would note here is that we don't, even though we have a growth tilt to the portfolio, we don't actually uh, invest in what I'll call story stocks. You know, stocks that everybody's talking about that uh, uh, are in the news. And the reason is, is that oftentimes by the time those, those stocks show up in the news, the price has already moved uh, to, reflect the, uh, to reflect the news that's, that's uh, underlying those stocks. 
And uh, one of the ways of seeing this is if you look here on this on this chart, what you see is that even though our uh, earnings growth rate, the forecasted growth for the companies in the portfolio is higher than that of the uh, of the benchmark, the value as represented through the, the PE ratio is actually lower. Um, and so it's a it's sort of a unique combination here of finding stocks that look like they're attractive from a valuation perspective, but have much better growth prospects than the benchmark as a whole. So um, this, this last slide before we jump into facts that just shows our, uh, uh, our top bets. And you see here, I've got two columns. One is the top 10 positions. And as the name indicates, those are just our, our biggest positions by weight. But importantly, when you're running a portfolio uh, and you're benchmarked against an index like the S&P 500, we're relative managers. And so an important part here is to be acutely aware of how big these stocks are within that benchmark that you're trying to beat. And we call that an active bet. And so where you'll see that companies like Apple and Microsoft, just because they're very large companies, are gonna be some of our biggest positions where we're making our bets in many cases are in companies like advanced drainage systems or Great Lakes dredge and dock companies that you may not have heard of and may not even be in the S&P 500, the benchmark that we're trying to beat. So let's jump into FactSet and see how we can identify stocks like this as part of our uh, idea generation or fundamental analysis process. And then importantly, how we, we manage these holdings over time. In fact, I'm going to start with what's called the portfolio monitor. So if you if you look in the upper left here, you see that I've got a uh, basically a set of tabs across the top and you can customize these tabs however you'd like. But uh, I tend to have portfolio first because when I log on, the first thing that I want to look at is how's the portfolio doing today? And that's what we get. Uh, that's what's captured here through the portfolio monitor. Um, and what you can see when I took this screen grab yesterday, in fact, if we look at the top, and I'm just going to, as we go through here, as I'm talking, I'm going to highlight the areas that uh, I'm referring to just to make it a little bit easier for you to follow along. So what you see at the top here is I've got a th three different charts. And basically what that shows me is my relative performance versus the S&P 500. And as you can see, when I took this screen grab yesterday, we were underperforming the market. OK, um, specifically, we we're underperforming by about 40 basis points or 0.4 percent. Um, and you can see that overall in the in the left hand chart here. Then if you want to get a little bit more granular, we can look and see which sectors were either helping or hurting our performance. And we were getting a little bit of help from industrials and consumer staples, but we were losing a lot in uh, IT and energy. And then again, we can look within those groups to see uh, which particular companies were either helping or hurting our relative performance. Now, below the charts, you have here um, basically uh, a list of all of our portfolio holdings. And I'm just gonna blow this up a little bit so that you can see what it is that, uh, that we're looking at here. And what I highlighted was the communication services sector. So each of the, uh, the, the students that are in the, the fund for the most part are working in teams where they manage their own sleeve of uh, stocks for a particular economic sector. So communication services here as an example. And what you see is, is that the stocks that we own, so in this case, we own companies like uh, Google, Walt Disney, Facebook, Puya, um, and T-Mobile. And we also have uh, a little bit in the XLC, which would be the uh, ETF for the communication services industry. Again, because they're managing their own portion of the overall fund. When they don't have money uh, being invested in a particular company, it's invested in the ETF, in this case, the XLC. Now, if you look, um, what this is going to show you is what's the weight versus the uh, the benchmark weight or B weight here. And the difference between the two, of course, as I mentioned earlier, is our active bet. Now, over to the far right, what you see is three columns. And one of the nice things about FactSet is that you can actually go in and uh, put in whatever data it is that you, that you want. Something that's meaningful for, for me 
um, as the advisor for, for the fund is the student's ratings, price target, and then my, the spread to their price target. And if we look at communication services, what we see here is that it looks like some of these uh, ratings are a little stale. Okay, so from a portfolio manager's perspective, that would be something that uh, you know you'd probably have have the analysts come into your office and ask some some detailed questions around the names because what we see here is that some names like uh, Google uh, or or even Walt Disney they're whole rated and they have less than ten percent upside, so that makes sense. But you can make the same uh, the same argument for uh, for Facebook. But what we see is, is that we've got uh, a, a hold rating on uh, T-Mobile, and yet there's 27% upside to the target. So that probably should be a, a buy rated stock. And, um, you know, that would be something that we, we would want to make sure that uh, gets updated so that uh, as, as we're thinking about how to either put money to work or where we should be trimming some positions, as the positions get closer and closer to our price target, expectation, of course, would be that we uh, sell some of those positions. And if the market uh, uh, it moves those stocks lower, if our conviction in them stays the same, then we want to be buying some of those positions. So you can get all of this information in one snapshot by looking at the portfolio monitor. Now, if you really want to dig into the analytics, and move away from real-time data, data you know, that's being driven by what's going on in the market today, what we can do is up on the, the upper uh, set of tabs here, the second tab is what we call portfolio analytics, okay? And this is one of the, uh, the real robust tools within FactSet. And it allows us to look at a wide array of different data. In fact, you can see those listed here along the left-hand side starting with exposures and exposures is just a fancy name for the weight of the securities in the portfolio relative to that benchmark that you're trying to beat and so we can see it listed uh, in a tabular format and then off to the right what we have is everything listed in in a graph in fact if you focus in on that graph for just a second what this is going to show is where we're either overweight or underweight relative to uh, the, the S&P 500. And what we see here is that we have some, uh, some overweights in uh, cash, energy, and industrials, and then underweights in utilities, materials, and consumer discretionary. Now, I would note that I, I took this snapshot yesterday. And so if we looked at this today, um, what you'd see is it'd look a little different. And the reason is, is that yesterday, we actually uh, took some of that money that was sitting in cash and we actually redeployed it into consumer discretionary. So we weren't making such a negative bet against uh, consumer discretionary stocks. So it would look a little bit more uh, like a, a sector weight portfolio because we took some of the cash that we had on hand. So you're always gonna have to be rebalancing but knowing where to rebalance, again, you can get that information by looking at the difference in weights, uh, which are illustrated here graphically. The other thing that I would mention is if we go back over to the, uh, to the left-hand side and we look at that table, what this is going to tell us is what's the weight of each portfolio holding relative to the weight in the benchmark, that is the S&P 500, and then the difference, which would represent our active bet. And you can see this, I, I brought up uh, our IT holdings so that you could see them. Remember, as we talked earlier, Apple and Microsoft were some of our biggest positions because they're big companies. Uh, but we see that in, in the case of Apple, as an example, we're actually betting against both Apple and Microsoft. We are we're underweight by about a, uh, 130 basis points for Apple and 50 basis points for, for Microsoft. Um, the other thing that I would note is that, again, because you can customize the, these reports however you'd like, which is one of the benefits of using something like, um, something like FactSet, we've also brought in the next earnings date. And the reason that's important is, is that if you're an analyst and you're covering this stock, you know that the stock's probably going to move when they report earnings four times a year. And so knowing when those upcoming earnings uh, reports are going to be is, is an important thing that you're going to want to monitor, particularly if you're thinking about uh, buying or selling stock uh, in the portfolio. So that's the exposures report. Um, 
Next is, let me jump down here for a second and look at the characteristics report. So remember where we started was we looked at the characteristics of the Babson College Fund. And what you can see here is where we're getting that information. In fact, we, let me blow this up a little bit. And so what you see here in the upper left is we have the summary characteristics. So um, again, we hold between 50 and 60 securities, 59 uh, when I took the screen grab yesterday versus 506 in the S&P 500. So that's why I say much more concentrated than the benchmark that we're trying to beat. And then a couple of things that I would highlight here, I've already, already talked about some of the characteristics, but um, one of the things that you see here is active share. And active share is something that, particularly if you're allocating money to a manager, say you're, at, you're thinking about adding money to the, the, the students who are managing the Babson College Fund. One of the things you're gonna look at is their active share. And anything that's 20 or below is considered to be passive. So it's just like an ETF or a passively managed index fund. Anything that is um, between uh, 20 and 60 is considered to be a closet indexer. In other words, they, they sort of hold themselves out as being active managers, but they're not really differentiated from the benchmark enough to truly be active. And anything above 60 is considered to be active. So you can see that at 72.5, we're right in that, we're right in that uh, sweet spot where we wanna be, actively uh, managing stocks with the uh, goal of outperforming the S&P 500, but doing it with uh, a lower level of risk that's, than what's represented within that, uh, that benchmark. And so all of this information, it can be, uh, can be uh, not just identified, but importantly analyzed by, uh, by bringing up these reports within, uh, within FactSet. I'd also note off to the right, you see these charts over here. And these are the characteristics over time. As you select any one of the items in this characteristics report, we can look and see how they're changing over time. And that's important. So in this case, we're looking at uh, uh, forecasted earnings growth. And as you can see, the fund has higher earnings growth potential than what's represented within the, the S&P 500. So if we're in a growthier market environment, the, this tilt would suggest that uh, the portfolio will, will outperform. And certainly we've seen that as we enter into uh, 2021, market continues to, to grind higher. And as a result, at, at last uh, check, um, we were up almost 200 basis points or 2% above the return that's been generated by the S&P 500. So that growth tilt, which is reflected here, um, obviously is something that's important. Now we've had a couple of down days. We saw one uh, on that portfolio monitor uh, just a couple of slides back. Well, if that continues to persist and the market moves lower, then obviously we would need to start repositioning the portfolio because um, we're going to underperform when money is being rotated into either more value oriented stocks or what might be considered defensive names. Uh, so you might think of like uh, consumer staples companies or healthcare companies falling in that broader category. All right, so that's the characteristics tab. Um, and let me jump down and look at one more here under portfolio analytics, and that's the attribution tab. Okay. And this is really where you can, you can take a look and see what's driving the manager's outperformance or underperformance relative to the benchmark. And so I'm just going to blow this up so you can see it a little bit better. And what you see here is that we've got what's called a two factor attribution, which means that we look at the manager's decisions and basically break them into two categories. They're either going to be uh, asset allocation decisions. In other words, how am I apportioning my, uh, my money across the different uh, economic sectors like tech or energy or financials that make up the, the portfolio? And then secondly, what is, how well am I doing in terms of picking stocks? Now, the fund is, is actually uh, considered a bottoms up uh, portfolio, meaning that we're trying to pick stocks that we think are going to outperform the S&P 500. So what you would hope to see is that most of the outperformance is coming from, the, uh, from stock selection. And so if you look over here on the right, 
under this, this attribution, what we see is, is that just as I mentioned a moment ago, we're outperforming by 186 basis points. Mm -hmm. uh, and what we see is that the majority of that is coming from stock selection. So again, that's what you would hope to see from a bottoms up stock picker uh, like the Babson College Fund. And then we're, we're getting a little bit more from, from massive allocation, those, those small tilts either overweight or underweight relative to the, uh, the sector weights in the benchmark. Sorry for some of the, uh, the background noise here. Uh, they're clear now, so it should get better. Um, let's see. So a um, couple of other things. Let's get a little bit more granular here. So let's look at the sectors that make up um, the portfolio. So there are actually 11 GIC sectors. GIC stands for Global Industry, Industry Classification Standard. It's basically S&P's way of classifying companies across the economic sectors. And what we see is, is that while we're, we've outperformed, most of that juice has come from the energy sector, right? Uh, basically, 100 of the 186 basis points has come from the energy sector. So energy has done very, very well. And you can see this, if we, if we come back just a little bit here, we see that energy, the return on that portfolio uh, year to date has been 41%. So our holdings in energy are up 41% just over, you know, in less than two months, which is fantastic. But when we look at it relative to the benchmark, the benchmark's up about half that at 20%. So that's why we're seeing such a big difference here in the uh, in the holdings. All right, so let me uh, let me open this up a little bit. So you'll notice over on the left here, if you look at the energy tab, which is highlighted in yellow, you see this little plus sign. Um, basically, what that is is that that allows you to expand or contract information that's within these fact set reports. So if I was to hit on that X, uh, or excuse me, that plus sign, what's going to happen here is that I'm going to get a list of all of the securities within that grouping, in this case, that economic sector. And what I see here is that um, some of the names that we have within the energy portfolio. So for uh, those are clean energy, uh, Solaris Oil Fields, EOD, Pioneer, and Renewable Energy. Um, and these stocks have done, as, as we see here, very, very well just over the last couple of months. But if you look at them over, let's say from June until today, the performance has, has been uh, even better. In fact, uh, if you use renewable as an example, that stock's moved from about 27 up to 110 during that, that time period. And so uh, energy has been a strong contributor for us for you know, probably a nine month period now. But this gives you some of the granularity and you can see how uh, the weighting within specific stocks along with their return is actually driving the relative performance. <laughs> Sorry, one second. Let me just, let me just step away for one sec. Okay, I'm back. All right, so we were talking about energy and looking at how energy has driven the performance. Now, um, what I was saying is it's not just the return that's going to generate uh, the attribution that you see here under the total effect category. It's also going to be the weight of the port of that holding within our portfolio. So, let's take a look at clean as an example. So. Clean, as you can see here, is about a percent of the portfolio, but, and that's basically the same as Solaris, 91 basis points versus 98. But what's different is, is that we get more uh, juice in terms of the total effect from, uh, from uh, Clean versus Solaris. And that's gonna be a function of the return that was, that was generated 
77% return, ver, or excuse me, 78% versus uh, 42%. So this allows you to get very granular and look at how your decisions, in this case, the stocks that you select for your portfolio and the weight of those stocks within the portfolio have driven your performance and not just your absolute performance. In this case, uh, the, what do we have here? 6.4% um, versus 4.5 for the S&P 500, but importantly to take that down to a uh, much more granular level. All right, so one thing, let me actually come back here for just one second. Um, one thing I wanted to point out is, you know, I've spent five or seven minutes probably at this point covering uh, portfolio analytics. And note, I've only covered three of the uh, reports that are off here on the left. So this is a really robust tool. You can get very, very detailed information that will allow you to make better decisions. But uh, hopefully this at least gives you a sense of um, how we, we use this day-to-day -day and week-to-week -week as managing the holdings within the portfolio. So that's the portfolio tab. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to actually uh, rotate and uh, look at um, the idea generation uh, tools within FactSet. And one of the most powerful ones is equity screening. And we don't have time today to get into to equity screening, but the way to think about it is this. You're basically trying to take this big universe of companies and whittle it down to a short list of companies that you can do some fundamental analysis on in order to determine whether or not they look like good candidates for your portfolio. And so when you think about that, um, think about it in terms of a funnel, okay? You start with this big universe of companies, and as you add different criteria, that list of companies gets smaller and smaller until you have the short list of companies that you can then analyze. And so uh, when I brought this up yesterday, uh, what came up was a, uh, a three-factor equity screen that I use. And basically, I, the universe, you know, that big group was the companies in the S&P 1500, so about 1500 companies, excluding financials and utilities. And so um, what we would, would get there is a, you know, a, a smaller list of companies, you know, probably somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, 1200 or so companies. And then what I did was I ranked those companies on three different factors. Um, and so, as I say, uh, we don't really have time to get into uh, it here, but what you can see is, is at the bottom here, I've got a list of results. So these would be the companies that made it through my equity screen. And the last column here, what's called the combined score is basically a ranking uh, from one to a hundred of best to worst. And you can see uh, we've got a genetics company, we've got Sleep Number Corporation, which obviously is a, you know, basically a mattress company. Interestingly enough, a company that was pitched in the Babson College Fund last semester was Purple, another, uh, mattress company that's done very, very well uh, this year. You know, obviously put, people are putting more money into their homes because they've been stuck in their homes for uh, during the pandemic and, and uh, uh, realized that, uh, you know, they should have been making some, some upgrades along the way. And uh, so some of these companies are benefiting uh, even today for, as a result of the pandemic. Um, but if you click on the parameters tab, which I've highlighted here on the right, Basically, this is going to show you the different uh, factors. And again, I use three things. I look for companies that appear to be cheap based upon an enterprise uh, value uh, basis, enterprise uh, value to EBIT specifically. I look for companies that uh, were high quality based upon return on invested capital. And then those companies that were starting to catch a bid. And the reason is, is that when you're using a tool like this within FactSet, Basically, what you're trying to do is to identify those companies that have a lot of promise for the future. Well, if you just look at companies that are cheap, some of those companies are cheap for a reason. Um, so we need to separate those that are cheap and probably going to get cheaper from those that are cheap and an attractive buying opportunity. And so one way of doing that is by looking at companies that first look cheap uh, based upon their, their price multiple, but have strong fundamentals 
and are starting to catch a bid, meaning that uh, the price is starting to move higher. And so it de-risks the situation that uh, you're buying into what uh, in the industry we would call a value trap. So if we, uh, um, if we look here, you know, we can go through the, the equity screening and, you know, perhaps, in fact, I mentioned to Leslie earlier, um, a, a, you know, another session on equity screening would probably be good just to get you comfortable with that because oftentimes as part of an internship or even full-time employment as you're, uh, as you're interviewing, they'll ask you to make a pitch. Well, if you have the ability of going through the screening and you could talk about the process there um, and the company or companies that fell out the bottom, well, you know, that again can set you apart from, from other candidates that are, that are being interviewed. Now, before we move on, I, I highlighted this tab at the top called uh, alpha testing. And alpha testing is the way that we would take these factors in the screen and actually back test them, meaning go back and see whether or not these factors were linked to subsequent returns by seeing how they would have performed through time. And rather than getting in there, I thought I would just show you the results of an alpha test that I did on this three factor model. Uh, several years ago. So again, what are we looking at? Cheap stocks uh, because they're trading at a low earnings yield. Um, high, uh, yeah, uh, low low EBITDA enterprise value, strong fundamentals, and uh, nice price momentum. And if we look here, uh, when I did this back test, this was when I was institutional portfolio manager, and so I back tested it over about a 15 year period from '96 through 2010. And over that period. That three factor model would have identified companies that would have returned 19.4% versus 7.9 for the S&P 500. So outperformance by uh, about 11.5% on an annual basis. So if you, if you could do that, you'd be in, uh, in good shape. Uh, you'd be raising a lot of capital. The other thing that I would note here is that um, a couple of things that were interesting. One is, is that you only had uh, four periods of, uh, uh, of time when you were underperforming. So in this case, uh, I forget what the exact uh, number was, but I want to say that it was, you know, you were outperforming three out of every four years. And, uh, you know, obviously that's important because you're going to be more likely to stick with a strategy if there's some consistency to it. Um, and you can see that here. And then the other thing that I would notice it, note is that is there's something we call upside and downside capture, which just simply means that uh, you look to see how would the strategy work in up markets and in down markets. And if you look here, like if we look at 1996, we see that when the market's up, the portfolio is up even more. And if we focus out here in 2002, when the market's down, the portfolio is down less than the market. So that's, again, sort of an ideal situation, meaning that there's going to be some consistency here because it doesn't really matter if the market's up or down. This strategy of identifying uh, fundamentally strong companies that are trading at low valuations, but yet are starting to catch a bid, seem to outperform in both uh, up and down markets. So. Just something to uh, to keep in mind there. Uh, you know, if you want to go back and see how that, uh, these different factors would have performed historically, it's always a good idea. Um, and we can even do it, ironically, uh, on a sector basis. So what you can see is is that as you're building out uh, an equity screen, you could actually look to see would this work better in financials or would it work better in in tech? Uh, just to get, get a simple example. So where I'm going to finish out today is by looking at one more tab, and this is the company and security tab. And the reason I, I wanted to finish out here is that this is where you'd really get in and start doing some fundamental analysis on a company that you identified through your equity screen. And so what you can see is I've got a whole list of reports off to the left, just like we saw with uh, portfolio analytics. And the first one I have here is the snapshot and the snapshot just simply shows things like the business description, basic corporate information, like uh, what are the company's business segments, where are they you know, where do they generate their sales geographically and things of that nature. And then we also get some key statistics off to the right here, like where are we within the 52 week range? Obviously this company's trading near the, the high end of its, of its 52 week range. 
Um, we also get some, some, some information on the, uh, the long-term growth profile of the company, about 15% uh, year over year, and the proportion that's being owned by institutional investors versus uh, retail investors or even insiders. Now, um, as we go down through these different reports, um, I just wanted to highlight some of those that are that are used and how they're being used as part of a fundamental analysis. Well, it, whether you're you own a company like Clean Energy, which we saw has been a you know strong uh, performer for us, or you're considering that company, oftentimes what you're going to do as part of your due diligence is that you're going to listen to the uh, quarterly earnings reports. And so by going to the event calendar, what you see here is the the date and links for their next earnings call, which in this case is March 9th. Um, and you also see what the street is expecting in terms of sales. Typically you'd see sales and earnings, uh, but in this case, basically there it, it's about flat on an earnings uh, basis. And then if we look uh, down below a little bit, not only do you get the upcoming events, but you also can go back and watch recordings of prior events. And uh, in fact, I've highlighted here for you um, one of the icons. And one of the best things about the earnings analysis within FactSet is that when you click on that tab, you're going to get not only the transcript, right, where you can read through and see the comments that were made by management, the questions that were asked by the street, and so forth. But what else you get is if you look in this upper uh, quadrant here, which I've highlighted, you actually get uh, to hear the recording at the same time. So you can go down through the transcript and be listening to the tone of voice from the management team, the conviction level that's being uh, exhibited and so forth. So you're getting some of that, you know, quote unquote body language uh, from uh, that you really couldn't get from just simply reading the transcript. The other thing is, see how it says find in document? What that means is, is that let's say I'm, I'm, uh, I'm really most interested in what their guidance was or what they said about the pandemic and how that's impacting their business model. I can simply type that in the find box and it's going to take me to that portion of the audio recording and that piece of the transcript where I can get that specific information on those things that are most meaningful to me. The other thing that I would note here is when you're looking at these uh, earnings transcripts, Oftentimes the prepared remarks aren't that different. You get a little bit more granularity versus the press release. But a lot of times what you're going to want to do is drop down to the Q&A. Because if you, if you listen and look at the first couple of questions, that's probably what uh, the investors are most interested in. And so that's obviously something that should be of interest to you as well as either a holder or a potential holder of the stock. So that's the invent calendar. And again, uh, you see earnings releases and press conferences and things of that nature, but also things like if they're presenting at a conference or what have you, all of that information is going to be under the calendar. We also have a uh, capital structure. So as you guys know from your classes, if you're building out a DCF model, as an example, uh, we, one of the things we're going to have to figure out is what's the cost of capital, which is going to be contingent on the capital structure of the company. Well, all that information is, is listed out here for you. So you don't have to go and try to dig through the filings in order to come up with that information. It's all laid out in a nice uh, orderly format here. And then um, what I would note is that we also have charts. So what I thought I would do um, is FactSet has a really um, powerful charting capability. And so I'm just gonna bring up a couple of charts for you to show you some of the things that you can do here. So this first chart just is simply a price chart where I've overlaid at the top the 50 and 200 day moving averages. So what we see here is you know this massive uh, uh, performance that the, that the company's had recently. Um, we actually have been selling some of our positioning clean. Uh, we didn't top ticket, but you know certainly was very close. So the team has done a very good job of of sort of staying uh, disciplined. And when they, you know, when they can't justify a higher price target, trimming the position rather than just riding the momentum. Um, and then in the second uh, second chart here, what you see is what we would call an overbought or oversold indicator, and uh, that's the, the the relative strength index. And basically, when it gets up in that red category, 
that means it's been uh, over uh, overbought. Uh, specifically, that it's you know the price is starting to to get frothy, and it's probably a good idea to re be reducing your position. And so you can get that information. Um, some of these are stock charts, uh, meaning that you just go in and you bring up the chart. But again, if you look off to the left, you're going to have the ability of uh, changing those. So if I didn't want, you know, if I thought, oh, relative strength of the index isn't that helpful to me, but another technical indicator like the MACD is more informative. I could just replace the relative strength index with the MACD by simply selecting uh, MACD on the left. Uh, two others that I threw in here. This has been uh, so I'm. I help the, the healthcare team, and this has been a source of contention for us um, in that uh, uh, I like uh, Bristol Myers, and so does uh, the executive in residence, John Hickling, but the, the team doesn't like it. Um, and one of the reasons that, that we like it here, interestingly enough, is that this blue line, as, as indicated, shows the, the PE ratio, so the forward uh, price to earnings ratio for the company. And you can see it historically. So if you look, it's it's really uh, contracted, right? So it was up around you know 37 times, uh, and it's contracted all the way down to single digits. It's now trading at eight times forward earnings. And these green lines basically represent the average multiple that it's traded at over time. And we can see that that's about you know 18, 19 times. Um, so again, it's about half what its average has been. And then I've also superimposed uh, plus or minus one standard deviation. So we're down, you know, trading near two standard deviations from where the stock has traded historically. You know, to me, that's interesting. At least uh, I don't, you know, at least you want to be asking questions as to is the company being permanently re-rated to a lower number? That's what the, that's what the team uh, assumes. Or is it just been punished, but because of a, uh, a new pipeline, they may, uh, they may actually be positioned to, to do quite well in the future, given how cheap that it's trading at, at least on a forward multiple basis. That would be the question you'd have to ask. And again, we're trying to use these charts as a way of, of making more informed decisions. It may not tell us the answer, but what it's gonna tell us is where to look. And so for a pharma company where we would wanna look, is their pipeline because the old adage is drug stocks trade on drug pipelines so you want to see whether or not there's something there that would get you excited about buying the stock today at this really low multiple the other thing that i would mention too is that um you know in this case the the stocks trading at a multiple below where it traded even back here during the global financial crisis uh so if you can get that historical perspective that too can be helpful um, as you're trying to make a decision today. Uh, and maybe you haven't held Bristol Myers in the past, but uh, you know, again, you can have a broader perspective on what investors have been willing to pay in different market environments. All right, and then the last chart that I, uh, that I threw in here was uh, Starbucks. And the reason is, is that you know, we're always trying to find what are the key drivers for a stock. And so in this case, one thing that's interesting is that Starbucks is uh, strongly correlated, as you, as you can see here, with home sales. Now, might not be the first thing that you think of uh, when considering Starbucks, but again, uh, you know, you can buy coffee from a lot of different places. You can make it at home, you can get it from Dunkin', or you can go to Starbucks. And as you think about that continuum, you're paying more and more so there's probably more discretionary income that's going to impact uh, Starbucks, just like it's going to impact people's ability to buy new, new, uh, new homes. And so we're seeing a correlation here. So understanding some of those key drivers can be another thing that's teased out uh, by looking at uh, some of these historical relationships. And importantly, what we're, uh, you know, what we're also seeing here is uh, means of, of trying to express our ideas. So, you know, that is, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words. If I say, oh, there's a strong correlation here between uh, existing home sales and uh, Starbucks, you might just blow it off. But if I show you this chart, you're probably going to be much more interested in, uh, in finding out, well, okay, if I go to the end of the chart here, uh, are existing home sales expected to go up or go down? Because that could be a factor that drives the performance of Starbucks going forward. All right, so um, a few other things, and then uh, I'm just going to open it up for, for Q&A. Uh, but 
you can obviously get uh, recent news. In this case, I've highlighted a couple. Um, you know, they just signed a new multi-year uh, contract with uh, Los Angeles. They also got an upgrade from Credit Suisse. You can get the details on these different um, these different news items that obviously will have an impact on what investors are willing to pay for uh, the stock. We can also look at who the investors are in the stock by going under the ownership tab. And you get some broad statistics at the top in terms of percentage of institutional ownership versus retail and, and insiders. And then down at the bottom here, we actually get to see who the biggest institutional owners are. Now, one thing that I would say here is you have to be careful with using these types of reports. And the reason is, is that if you look at the top, uh, you know, let's say the top five or the top 10 that I have here, well, if you start carving these out, Vanguard, uh, SSGA, and, and some, a lot of these others, they're just ETFs, right? These, the only reason that they own this stock is that it's in an index, okay? So that's not really useful or helpful to me. I want to focus more in uh, uh, what other active investors are, are looking at. And so there, what you might want to do is two things. One is, you know, look for... Uh, you know, maybe look at the hedge fund managers and look at, you know, what what fund managers are taking a position here. Um, look at activist investors to see if there are activists that are getting involved, because oftentimes activists can can be um, a a tool for change. Uh, you know, ideally we'd like to think of it as positive change in terms of uh, the fundamentals for the company and ultimately the stock price. But you can get a lot of that detail. Um, you also, you know. Quite frankly, if you see that other smart investors are taking a position here, it should, just like an equity screen, be a place that you, you might want to look for potential holdings. All right. Um, and then, you know, last but not least, I just wanted to, you know, show you if you need to get detailed financial information, obviously we can get all the history that's that's available. You know, this shows you um, the, the financials for the company. And importantly, it's not just the financial statements, but, you know, oftentimes in your classes and, and otherwise, you might be asked to do some ratio analysis. Well, all of those ratios have actually already been calculated for you. And what you can do is instead of spending your time on calculating the ratio, you can spend your time interpreting the ratio. Is it trending higher or lower? Well, obviously, for profitability ratios, like we see at the top here, we'd like to see those improving. Um, if it's debt related, we'd like to see those numbers uh, getting lower or at least being manageable. So those types of, uh, you know, allows you to focus where, again, you can make better decisions and, uh, you know, ultimately for, for something like the Babson College Fund, where you can actually generate better returns. And then uh, what we see is not just historical data, but forward looking data through the estimates reports. And you can see there's a whole host of, of estimates reports. And uh, what we see is that all this information that you have on this report, this is, this is just sales. Uh, we can do the same thing for operating income, for earnings, uh, uh, and every other item that makes up a P&L or a balance sheet, where you're getting that information on what are, what are, the, what are the street's expectations for how these uh, figures are going to play out over the next quarter, uh, two quarters, three quarters, uh, or over the next several years. And so I brought in quarterly information as well as forecasted information for, for the next two years on these reports. And what you can see is, is that you can get the entire income statement. So think about it. If, you're, if you've been asked to sit down and, and do evaluation on a company, and you know the first thing that you're going to have to do is start forecasting uh, what the income statement and balance sheet are going to look like, isn't this a great place to start? Because you've got uh, the street's consensus on what those figures are going to be. And then what you can say is, okay, how does my view compare to the consensus view? And in fact, uh, if we drill down one more level here, what we see under this product segment is that we can actually look at this on a very granular basis. We can look at product versus service. We can look at uh, one uh, segment versus another. And if we think that, let's say, uh, service sales are going to be much better because they've, uh, they've recently done an acquisition that gives them uh, access to a wider group of potential customers and upselling opportunities into the service area than what we've seen in the past, 
Well, then that's meaningful and that's something that we can reflect in our model relative to what's uh, in consensus. Because at the end of the day, if you're gonna outperform the market, remember, not only do you have to be different, but you, importantly, you have to be right. And so uh, being able to understand what's already reflected in the stock price and these consensus estimates is an important first step in doing just that. Um, the, the last thing, and I sort of, uh, uh, this is sort of, uh, you know, my cheeky way of uh, ending this, this presentation, but you notice at the top here, it shows the buy rating for, for the company. There are four analysts that cover the stock. Again, we look for those areas where, you know, there may not be as much coverage and therefore higher probability of mispricing. You have the 15% long-term growth rate. Uh, and then we see their price target of $25. You know, this is one thing where it's going to be in every single uh, subscription service, whether it's Backset, Bloomberg, Thomson Reuters, or something else. But it's one of those things that, you know, if you're an, uh, an analyst or a portfolio manager, you want to ignore it, okay? Because, uh, frankly, it's, it's not helpful information. And to see this, what I did was I, I brought up one last report here, which is the uh, broker outlook report. And if you look at this chart at the top, what you see is that these dotted lines represent the consensus price target. And what you see is, is that it's always just a little bit above the price, right? And then what happens? Well, over here at the end, the price moves up. So what happens to the price target? It moves up accordingly. And now where are we? We're at a point where the price targets moved way up, but the stock price is starting to come down. And so don't look to the price target as something that's going to help you to make better decisions. It's always either going to be a lagging indicator or you're going to find that the, that the sell side analysts are just using it as a means of uh, you know, justifying the rating that they have uh, on the stock. And so it tends to be you know, 10, 15 percent higher than where the, when, where, where the price is. But what is really useful is who those analysts are because as part of the primary research that you're gonna to wanna to do on a stock, you're gonna to wanna to make sure that you know who the analysts are, who the better analysts uh, importantly are so that you can be not only following their work, but as you're, you're reaching out and trying to, to better understand the situation, you can be reaching out to, to those analysts in order to get key insights, not only on the specific company that you're looking at, but importantly, uh, the, uh, the uh, uh, the industry in which they're covering because they cover a very small sliver of the broader market and they tend to uh, have very good contacts with those within those industries and know the competitive dynamics really, really well. All right, so with that, um, I just wanted to uh, open it up to you guys for specific questions on uh, FactSet and, and what you've seen here today. This is great, thank you so much. Would you be willing to share the materials? Oh, sure. Awesome. Thank you. We're actually working on a, a place on the Cutler Center website where not only are we going to be posting these materials and the recordings, but also uh, you'll see a lot of workshops and other things that you can come in and, and you utilize when you're in front of the terminals. And the nice thing about the, uh, the workstation is, is you've got these large uh, curved monitors so you could have the work uh, the, uh, you know, let's say tutorial up on one side and the application on the other and walk through it step by step. That's great, thank you. The other thing that I would note um, is if, so FactSet's installed on all of the terminals within the, the Cutler Center, but if you want access to FactSet outside the Cutler Center, you can also request that access. You just simply need to send an email to, to Leslie um, with your name, your email address, and your expected graduation date. And then what we do is we bulk those, uh, meaning that we send them to FactSet all at once and then they process those. So if you could get, uh, you know, get that information to Leslie by March 1st, and then she can send them all over at once rather than trying to do it in a, in a piecemeal uh, format. And then what you can expect is, you know, it's probably sometime on the 3rd, 4th uh, of March, you'll get uh, a username and password and you'll get some detailed instructions on how to download it uh, for your own laptops. I have a quick question. Uh, first sure. off, thank you, Leslie and Patrick. Um, I was just wondering, so you mentioned, Patrick, you mentioned that uh, 
you're sure that you're betting against Apple and Microsoft. And I was just wondering, is that, does that just mean you're, you're using puts and shorting against them or are you just under, are they underrepresented in your portfolio relative to the S and P? I was just wondering if you could expand upon what you meant by that. Yeah. Great, great question. And so, uh, it's the latter. It's, it's not that we're, we're actively betting against them. Um, but rather that, uh, we have an underweight relative to the weight in the benchmark. And so, um, it probably means that we think that they're around fair value, uh, but obviously to fund an overweight in something that we really like, we have to have an underweight in other things. And sometimes if you've got a stock that's, that's really big, like an Apple or a Microsoft, that can be a source of funds if you think that it's, that it's fairly valued. Um, we're always a, acutely aware of um, where we are in terms of uh, our explicit bets, meaning that we've, we've taken a look at a company uh, and we either like it or we don't like it, and then we'll express our position accordingly. But also the fact that we make implicit bets on everything in the benchmark that we don't own. So, you know, if we don't own a specific stock and it does well, it's going to help the benchmark, but it's going to hurt us. And so we need to be aware of those, those implicit bets, just like we are at our explicit bets, uh, if we're going to not only outperform, but importantly, consistently outperform over time. I have a question about like the amount of positions because I saw so it was 59, which is lower than the S&P, but still like pretty high. I think like, is there any reason why it's not like 20 to 30? Because I feel like if you had 20 to 30, you could have a way deeper understanding of all the companies. And when you have 59, it's kind of like you're diversifying away from like your highest convictions in a sense. Yeah. So the number does does fluctuate. I, you know. So let me say two things to that 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 effect. One is is that um that 59 would include uh 11 or you know probably close to 11 of the etfs you know, as i say you know that's what we use when the money's not being actively invested um so the number's a little a little bit higher than it would be at least shaded a little higher but uh to get back to your question let's say it's 20 versus 40 or 20 versus 50. um part of it is that uh the sector teams are managing their their own sleeve and so that ultimately is going to lead to a, you know, a little bit bigger number of holdings than what you might have otherwise if you just had one portfolio manager that was managing the entire fund. Second is that uh, as we look at it, certain sectors just simply require more holdings. Um, and the reason is, is that there's a lot more volatility. So let's say that we, we look at healthcare as an example. We may be comfortable trying to pick the best uh, you know, the best managed care stock, meaning health insurance company out there. Um, and the reason that we can do that is that if we look historically, you know, those stocks tend to trade in groups. Um, so if one's up, you know, probably uh, the others are up. So you just try to get the, the, the best one out of the bunch. Whereas if you look at something like biotech, you can have one stock that's up 70% while another's down 60% just based upon study data or FDA approvals or other things that are going to drive those stocks. So there's, they're a lot more idiosyncratic is what we would say. And as a result, we, we find that we need to hold more names to be a little bit more diversified in those spaces so that um, if we do have a stock that, that, that's down a lot, maybe have, we have another one that's up a lot that helps to, to offset that. It's just harder to pick winners in certain spaces than others. I, I completely understand. Thank you. Sure. Um, I had a really quick question. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if the positions which you take in the Babson College Fund, is it only restricted to the US markets or you even take positions in the international markets? Yeah, great question. So um, we can take uh, positions in uh, companies outside the US. The only thing is, is that they have to be in the form of an ADR. Uh, and so um, an ADR is just an American depository receipt. It's basically a way of having a foreign company listed on a U.S. exchange. And so as long as it's in an ADR, then uh, we have access to it. And, you know, to be honest with you, I've worked at a number of investment firms that have had, this, you know, the same uh, basic requirements. So it's not something unusual. Um, and importantly for us, we, we try to be opportunistic. And so that might mean going down the cap spectrum and looking at companies like clean energy that we explored today, but it can also be going across geographies and, and looking for opportunities. So, um, you know, one of the, one of the 
questions that we that was brought up in a recent session that we had with the healthcare team as an example is if you look at uh, some of the fidelity funds um, that are actively managed within healthcare, they they have positions in some of the U.S. pharma companies, but they also own companies like Roche, Sanofi, and and some other international companies. And so you you want to have an opinion on on those stocks because again. If Roche or Sanofi or one of these others are taking share from the U.S. companies, that's you know obviously there's going to be a rotation there, and we want to we want to make sure that we're positioned accordingly. Obviously, anytime you go outside the benchmark, you're taking on more risk because if you're wrong, it's going to hurt you, and it doesn't uh, correspondingly hurt the the benchmark. Um, so we we always try to make sure that we really diligence those ideas. But um, typically through the process and even the fact that to get approval, the stock when it's pitched has to get a 70% uh, approval rating from the team, including uh, students in the fund and the executive uh, in residence who act as mentors for the students. Um, you know, it doesn't always happen, but typically, uh, you know, there's been a, a lot of vetting that's gone along in the process to give us the conviction to put real money behind a particular idea. Sure, thanks. Sure. What else? I got another one about sure. uh, it's, it's the answer is probably no, but I want to ask it anyway. Um, has like the Babson College Fund ever done this or considered like investing in pre IPO companies, like like private companies? Yeah, yeah so um, not to my knowledge. Um, not that not that there's a there's would be something that you know. So if you look at the mandate that's been given to us by the Board of Trustees Investment Committee, basically what they have said is that it should be an all equity portfolio. We can take, uh, and, it, and to begin with, it was all equity long only, but you could uh, buy into international stocks as long as, as they were ADRs. Over time, I think we've become a little bit more sophisticated and that's been in part because the investment committee has confidence that you know, it's, we're not a bunch of cowboys uh, that are out just sort of, uh, you know, gunslinging. It's more that there is a real rigorous process and you've got the executives and residents that are acting as mentors for the students. And so changing the mandate to allow us to take short positions. And then uh, last year, you know, I was able to get them to allow us to, to, add, to uh, add to it by giving us access to derivative contracts. And like with CRC, really helped our performance as a result. It's the only, you know, quite honestly, the only derivative that we've used since getting that change to the mandate. And so we use these tools sparingly, um, but there's not, there's nothing to say that we, we couldn't uh, expand into, let's say the private equity space as well. Um, some of our executives and residents like Pete Saperstone are actually, um, you know, private equity managers. And so we've got some expertise there. Also, I would say the broader endowment is heavily weighted towards private equity. I want to say that uh, you know, last look, I think we had 28 uh, or 30 percent invested in private equity, which is much much larger than what you typically see for an endowment. Uh, but again, uh, we've we've developed some expertise in that area and feel that uh, you know we can we can do well in that space. And one of the interesting things about private equity is is that if you develop those relationships earlier than your peers. What that's going to mean is, is that as those better managers open their second fund, third fund, fourth fund, uh, you're going to get access to those where you'd be pretty much, uh, you wouldn't have access to them if you didn't have those relationships uh, already established. Thank you. Sure. What other questions? I have another one if uh, no one else can ask anything. Um, yeah, it's about like, uh, has the Babson College Fund ever had like a 10 bagger or like a 10 X stock in its life? Yep. Uh, that, uh, if you, so you saw the strong performance on the, on the energy team. Uh, we, we've actually had uh, a number of stocks that have done, done very well there. I brought up, uh, Reggie and that's one that's renewable energy group. 
I want to say that I bought into that one because I own that one in my PA. And uh, so I, I know it a, a little bit better. But that one, I bought it at, at like, say, $9. And as I say, it's it's 110 or so at least last, you know, I think it was down to, you know, the last couple of days it got hit pretty hard. So it was in the high 90s, but certainly been up in that 110 range. That's just one one example. But yeah, uh, you know, we certainly look for the elusive 10 bagger. Uh, but from a portfolio management perspective, we need to be really focused on um, the benchmark because if you, one of the first things that I did when I got involved as the advisor is I went back and I, I tried to get as much historical information on the performance of the fund as I could. And one of the things that I noticed is in, in those years when you had big uh, negative returns is that what happened was, is they were what I would consider not benchmark aware, right? They they didn't have much that was represented in the benchmark in the portfolio, and so uh, they were they were basically betting against the the benchmark stocks that did well, and at the same time, their stocks which weren't in the benchmark did very poorly. And so we always start with, in fact, the the first or second class every semester is a benchmark review where we look at the top ten uh, stocks within each of the economic sectors. And you have to give an, a, an educated opinion on the stocks. So if you, you know, if you already own it, fine, we already own it. But if you don't own it, you have to, you have to be able to articulate wh why we don't own it, uh, what we don't like about it. So that we know that it's not just that it's been missed, that again, it, it's, it's an explicit bet. We've looked at it, we've done the work and we don't like it. So we're willing to bet against. Um, and if we, we do that and we get, uh, where we're comfortable with where we're positioned relative to the benchmark, then we can take some of those, uh, what in the industry we would call rifle shots, where we look at some of these smaller companies that we think could be 10 baggers and uh, put them into the portfolio. But again, put them into the portfolio at an appropriate weight. So if we're wrong, we don't get taken out of the game. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you. Sure. Peter, you've got to have another question. <laughs> I uh, my questions are more like about the process to getting into BCF, but I was thinking I noticed that there's like an info session coming up, so I was just going to save my my questions till then. Sure. I mean, I would just say generally that you know the more that you can do, uh, you know, whether it be sessions like this, whether it be financial modeling programs, or even the courses that you take, the more you know, the more things that you do like that. Uh, that helps differentiate you from some of the other candidates, the better. Uh, because, you know, I think one of the, the big advantages of a program like BCF is that you're utilizing tools like FactSet that industry professionals use. And so it doesn't matter if it's hitting the ground running when you come into the program where everyone feels like, you know, the, the, the sort of analogy people use is drinking out of a fire hose. Uh, when they first come into the program, but it doesn't matter if it's that or if it's, you know, you're going out and doing an internship or full-time employment. If you go in and uh, you show up day one, and you could sit down in front of a Bloomberg terminal and get the information that the analyst or the portfolio manager needs. You're already setting yourself apart from the other people that are in that same internship program. So the probability of you getting that that offer at the end of your internship is that much higher. And so if you can do those types of things, not just in preparation for BCF, but as part of your degree program, the better situated you're going to be. And frankly, I, you know, I've, I've had some history with working with students, you know, just over the years, not just teaching, but also being involved with centers like Cutler. And, you know, I always go back and sort of do this, where are they now type of thing, where I look back and see where the people who would work for me in, in the Cutler Center or uh, other places are now. And it's always, you know, really, I don't know what the right word is for it, but I'm impressed. Um, and, you know, pleased that I was sort of part of that process because in, in many ways, it's, it's, it's surprising that they've been able to achieve what they have in such a short period of time post-graduation. Awesome, thank you so much. Sure. I have like one last question. It's about like just the biggest failures that the Babson College Fund has had, and you touched upon like looking at the past performance and getting a lot of insight out of that. But is there anything that happened like while you were like leading it that led or that like allowed you to gain a lot of insight? Like a, just like a I don't know like a stock pick gone awry or like a something that people overlooked or underlooked. I don't yeah that would be helpful. So 
I don't know if this is going to directly answer your question. If not, we can, you know, we can talk about specific stocks, but the, the biggest challenge for a fund like this is just the continuous turnover of the students that are involved with the program. You figure they're involved from not for nine to 12 months. And so, you know, just about the time that I'm getting excited and that I feel like these guys are hitting on all cylinders, they graduate or they finished up their second semester. And then we're starting all over again, largely from scratch when you think about it. Uh, in fact, when I, when I talk with the trustees, I always, you know, just as a sort of a reminder, should we have ba a bad year? I always say, you know, you probably wouldn't be too excited if I went and pitched a fund where I said that I was going to replace my analysts and my portfolio managers every nine months. Um, and so, you know, to me, that that's a challenge. And people are going to move up the learning curve at different rates. And so I think where, you know, where we've gotten into trouble is, is that, uh, you know, sometimes throughout that process, sometimes a, a stock gets approved that that shouldn't have been. Um, but hopefully, if it's if it's sort of a, a what I would consider a bad idea or or maybe one that we haven't sufficiently uh, diligenced, then you know in that next step of sizing it in the portfolio, either myself or the the one or two people who serve as the executive PM for the fund can work with the analyst or even uh, their team to make sure that it's not too big a portion of uh, the portfolio. So um, there are sort of safeguards that are embedded there. The other thing that I would note too is that I always advocate for people to do, you know, some people in the industry will call them an after action report uh, to use a military term. Some people will, will call them postmortems, uh, which you know, obviously is more of a medical term, but basically, I think it's always good when you sell a position that you do a, a postmortem. And what a lot of times will happen is, is that people will focus on postmortems when they, when they got it wrong and they lost money. And certainly that's important, right? Because it will uh, you know, help you to identify where you went wrong and ultimately to, to ensure that uh, you, you improve your process so you don't make similar mistakes in the future. But I think that it's equally important to look at uh, doing a postmortem when you actually won, uh, when you had a gain on a stock. And the reason is, is that when you do that, what you, what you have to do is you have to go back and you, you say to yourself, okay, what drove the strong performance of the stock? And usually in retrospect, you can look back and you can point to one or two things that drove the performance of the stock. And then what you have to ask yourself is, was, were those things that drove the stock what were the, the, the crux of my thesis on the stock? And if not, guess what? That wasn't good analysis. You just got lucky. Um, and luck's a, you know, a factor that we have to, to deal with in this business. And so asking ourselves whether we were lucky or we were good um, can also be a, a, an equally uh, good way of ensuring that um, the process continues to improve and that the people involved at any given time continue to evolve. Uh, there's a lot less of, hey, you know what? That was a great, great pick. Uh, when you know that you're gonna have to actually go back and look and make sure that uh, you didn't get lucky. You, you weren't just lucky, that uh, you actually did identify those drivers in advance. And doing it in advance is a lot harder than doing it uh, in retrospect. Okay, thank you, that was, that was really helpful. Thank you sure. for the answer. Any final questions? Great. I appreciate you guys taking the time today uh, to meet with me. I'm sorry that uh, we, we did go. My presentation went a little longer than I expected. So you know, I'm sure some people had to jump off, but uh, glad you guys were able to stick around. And uh, if you have any follow-up questions, at least for me in particular, uh, whether it be related to BCF or to uh, facts, I'd certainly reach out at any time. Yeah, and I just want to quickly note to all of you guys too, um, we we have eight Cutler Center assistants on our staff this semester, um, and they are available all week long and throughout the weekends as well. So for those of you who are on campus and you're able to come into the Cutler Center, I, I do encourage you to do so, um, you know, just to get started on whether it's FactSet or some of the other uh, tools we have available, and they can help you navigate some of those tools um, and answer any questions you have too. Um, for students who are fully online, you also can um, access them. Um, I would 
point you to our website where you can find details on who our assistants are, their schedule, and, and the various ways that you can reach them. So definitely check that out if you haven't already. And then just to quickly preview our next session, uh, which will be Friday, March 5th at noon, we have uh, two of our Cutler Center assistants, Kathleen Aurora and Gabriel Papa, and they're going to provide an introduction to the Bloomberg Terminal. So they'll show the students how to get started, uh, talk a little bit about the Bloomberg Market Concept uh, Certification Program, and also show some of the key functionality um, there. So I uh, hope you guys will join us for that and um, you know more details to come on additional sessions as well. So um, thank you again. Thank you to Patrick for doing the session today. Uh, really informative and I appreciate all of the students uh, for you guys joining, joining us. So have a nice weekend and uh, have a good afternoon. Thank you both so much. Thank you so thank much. You. This was Thank super you, helpful.